Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Burke and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion on uh, optimizing LED and electronic performance using silicone solutions manufactured by the CHT group and distributed through us here at Chemical Concepts. Uh, during the webinar, we're going to be going over silicone solutions on topics such as uh, preventing electrical failures and overheating, the benefits of silicones compared to epoxies and polyurethanes, and application techniques and the products CHT has available for you. Uh, well, during the presentation, we're actually going to be doing some live demonstrations as well, so you'll get to see that. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all be joined by a group from CHT and uh, Andrew Morris here. So Andrew's going to lead the way. Andrew, he's here. He's a national sales manager here at Chemical Concepts. Andrew, how you doing? Uh, doing great. Thanks, John. Joining him at CHT will be Chris Martin. He runs New Business Development. Chris, how are you? Excellent, John. Welcome, folks. Uh, joining Chris will be Tara Hickman. She's uh, CHT's regional sales manager. Tara, how are you? Wonderful, thanks. Welcome, and everybody. And finally, we have Michael Fowler, who's the technical advisor, and he'll be performing live demos here today. Michael, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Welcome, everybody. Great. Great. So before we do get into this, I do want to be clear that we will be uh, recording this entire session. Uh, so you guys will be emailed a copy after, after we're done. You'll get that within 24 hours. We'll also be monitoring the uh, chat box and the Q&A box in your Zoom uh, window there. So feel free to drop any questions during the presentation or, uh, or we'll answer them after or during, depending on, on whatever we uh, have some time. So uh, I think that about wraps things up. Andrew, you wanna, wanna start us off? Great, thanks, John. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Today's discussion is about potting and encapsulation materials for LEDs and other electronic components. Uh, so if you're an LED manufacturer that is looking for a better way to protect your LEDs without sacrificing light transmission, uh, or you're a sign manufacturer looking for a way to produce uh, signage in coastal and marine environments, our goal is to give you a good overall picture of the problems our products solve, uh, some considerations while selecting material, uh, and how to use them. And, and by the end, I think you'll walk away with a better concept uh, of potting materials in general and what you might be looking for the next time a project comes up uh, where an encapsulant uh, is needed. So for the agenda, we're gonna start off with an overview of the basics, uh, then followed by a discussion of the common challenges associated with LEDs. Uh, then we're gonna discover some of the special, uh, or, sorry, cover some of the special ca characteristics of silicone and how it compares with uh, other available chemistries on the market. Uh, next, we'll have the live demonstration where we'll actually show some potting applications. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, then we'll give you a, a few case studies to give you some real world examples where silicone solutions were successfully implemented. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with the uh, Q&A where we'll try to leave plenty of time for your questions, which is uh, certainly something we wanna do. So uh, there is a brief survey at the end. We'd like to hear your feedback. So, um, but, uh, so please feel free to share with us your thoughts. Uh, if at the end you are ready to get started, we are, I did want to mention, we're offering a promotional deal uh, for attendees kind of as a thank you for joining us today. Uh, so if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to look out for the follow-up email after the event for details there. Um, we are also, also offering free consultations, so we would be happy to lend our expertise uh, if you do have an application where you uh, need some assistance. Uh, before we dive in, I did want to give you some very brief background on chemical concepts. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we are product assembly people. So manufacturers and engineers of all kinds uh, come to us when they have uh, design challenges or applications where uh, traditional fastening methods can't be used. Uh, perhaps they're looking for process improvements. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, we provide solutions involving adhesive, sealants, tapes, uh, and or specialty fasteners. Uh, we do have a great team of subject matter experts to make those recommendations. Uh, we are active in various industries, including uh, stone and solid surface fabrication, transportation, signage, composites, as well as electronics manufacturing. Um, we are located in the uh, northeast of the U.S. in the Philadelphia area. And as you can see, we've been around a long time, coming up on 60 years. Uh, we are a distributor of CHT USA, who is uh, co-hosting this event with us today. And speaking of which, uh, now Tara is going to give you a little bit about CHT. Tara? Wonderful. Thanks, Andrew. Um, welcome. Again, my name is Tara Hickman. I am the Regional Sales Manager for CHT USA. Um, to give you a brief introduction to CHT and who we are, CHT is a custom silicones elastomers manufacturer based in Richmond, Virginia. We were founded in 1997 as Quantum Silicones. 
2017, we became part of the CHT Group, which is a global foundation-owned company based in Germany. And we focus on long-term partnerships, providing technical expertise, and offer flexibility and product customization for both small and large companies. CHT has an extensive portfolio of products and solutions with potting and encapsulants, gels, as well as others. And we serve a wide array of industries, such as you see here, including electronics, LEDs, and lighting. Um, we will now cover some common challenges seen in the LED and electronics and, and why silicon is a great fit for these applications. Um, let's look at why components need protection and issues to avoid premature failures. Electrical failures can be caused by many factors. Um, corrosion, vibration, thermal stress from temperature changes as the components heat up and cool down. Mechanical shock or impact can affect performance. Another are harsh environments um, and outdoor elements, the sun, extreme temperatures or wind and rain. These can all negatively affect the boards and components and will lead to electrical failure if not protected. Uh, another area of concern is in electronics is overheating. As we mentioned, the temperature fluctuations during uh, thermal cycling and reaching too high of temperatures, you will need to pull that heat out and away from the components. Also, as everything is getting smaller in the electronics world and the drive to have smaller electronic packaging, the components are still generating significant amount of heat. So your electronic components need protection from these types of issues. Um, these are areas where silicones can help to protect your electronics. In choosing a material for LEDs and electronic components, there are properties to consider in making your decision and, and why silicone is used over other inorganic chemistries. In this chart, we list physical properties of the different types of chemistries used, these being silicones, epoxies, and polyurethanes. Here you see the areas where silicones can offer benefits that other chemistries may not. Silicones exhibit very low shrinkage. So a benefit in the processing step is once the part is filled or potted, it will remain at that fill rate. So there's not a need to refill as with other chemistries. Silicone is a soft, flexible, low modulus material as opposed to epoxies and polyurethanes, which is critical to your components. This allows the components to expand and contract as they thermal cycle. Otherwise, with harder chemistries, this could cause damage and failure to the PCB components. Another important one in LEDs, um, the need for a clear non-yellowing silicone. Silicones are inherently non-yellowing as compared to the others. Um, we will touch a bit more on that in the next slide. The other chemistries, cannot survive very high or very low temperatures where silicones perform very well. Um, in addition, some customers will like to be able to repair their components and silicones allow for this as it is also repairable or self-healing and silicones also offer low toxi toxicity. In discussing LEDs, we need to talk about light transmittance. The LED market, you want to understand this effect. Silicones have an excellent transmission rate through a wide variety of wavelengths and expo when exposed to UV and heat. In the picture here, the column on the left represents silicone. And as you can see, the silicone remains clear and does not yellow as opposed to epoxies and urethanes under these conditions. The design of your components is as critical as selecting the right material. So when you're designing your part, whether it be an LED driver or the boards themselves, you must plan for a path for air to escape as you're filling the part. Make sure you're around the corners of the housing. You want to stay away from corners that are 90 degree. Um, add through holes for air release. This is to prevent air entrapment or voids. You want to fill the part completely to avoid future failure. 
design the board with a planned material injection point as well. Also expect leaks. Wires may need to enter or exit the potting. Ensure the points of entry are sealed, including sealing the heat sink. Check connectors for leak paths and either use sealed connectors or seal with an RTV sealant anywhere the material can escape or leak. Get the most out of thermally conductive housing. Heat will build up on the circuit board and you will need to draw that heat out or dissipate, dissipate the heat. Um, if you have heat sinks or will use the housing as a heat sink, use an RTV thermally conductive adhesive to pull the heat out. Lastly, plan how to orient the parts to allow for air release and complete fill penetration into the part. These things will help simplify processing, save material, and reduce defects. Application techniques. In potting of a, a traditional LED lamp, there are a couple different styles, the flat or D channels and 90 degree corner channels. When potting LEDs, again, air is the enemy. Air bubbles or voids in the silicone will scatter light. A couple things to keep in mind, if you're gonna hand mix the material, you will introduce air into the product as you hand mix. So you will need to degas the material after mixing to eliminate bubbles in your finished product. Ideally, you would utilize a meter mix system and dispense directly into the housing. When dispensing, you want a gentle flow rate with the end of the mix nozzle as close to or just below the dispensed silicone surface to prevent any air entrapment during the dispensing process itself. You may want to tilt the board or channel up on a slight angle. You can fill the part on this angle and the material will fill itself up the board and release air out of the part as it fills. Additionally, you are applying the board to a channel. You may want to make sure if there's air behind that board, you will want to fill that space and a thermally conductive product will work well to fill that area. You can also reduce light absorbing surfaces by using a white reflective non-yellowing silicone, which we can offer. And as well, we offer a black pigmented product for color enhancement. One thing to keep in mind as you fill these parts, all materials covering an LED will result in some transmission or color change shift. So plan for this. Um, now I will hand this off to Michael Fowler for a live demonstration. He will demonstrate dispensing an optically clear silicone into an alum aluminum channel. Thank you, Tara. Thank you very much. Um, today we're gonna to be looking at q 214 out of a cartridge uh, to avoid any air entrapment. As Tara had mentioned, if you hand mix the material, uh, this has been pre-dispensed, you can see all the air bubbles. So this has been hand mixed. You'll have to remove the air bubbles before applying to the LED channel. But using a cartridge, you can eliminate you can eliminate air bubbles. minimize air bubbles um, while dispensing into the jar or into your part. So you want to use a smooth, steady, keep the tip as close to the LEDs as possible. And you're looking for protection for the electronics and the LEDs. You might have to go over this a couple of times. When applying the LED strip, as Tara mentioned, some air can be behind the LED strip. So if there's any air bubbles that seem to pop up after your LED strip is, or your silicone is dispensed, you can use compressed air to blow any air bubbles off. This is a cured LED channel. 
to give you an idea of what it'll look like. And this is just a generic lens we made out of the Kiesel 214. Now we'll get back to Chris Martin and discuss design process. Well, thanks, Michael. My name is Chris Martin, and I am the new business development manager for CHT USA. I'd like to discuss, you know, the process of getting the material into the part. It is as critical as the material selection and the design. So how do you do that? How do you get the material into the, into the parts? You really have several options. You can hand mix, and as Mike demonstrated, hand mixing requires uh, degassing. You know, again, you're gonna incorporate a lot of air. And it will reiterate to you that air is the, really the, the enemy here. And that's usually where we see, usually where we see um, uh, the biggest issue that you have. So, you know, again, you have several options. You can hand mix. Uh, when you go to a, a static mix nozzle system, you have, um, you know, you can decrease the air significantly. And a static mix nozzle can be used on a cartridge, a dual cartridge, like a one-to-one -one or a 10-to-one -one kind of system, or uh, the meter mix system, which is, again, a more automated process. All of these uh, systems, these uh, static mix, uh, mix systems can help decrease that um, opportunity of gaining air into the material. Again, when uh, regarding uh, products, uh, you know, again, when you're looking at designing your system to uh, to be used on the products that you're you're developing or working with, you know, you maybe have selected a thermally conductive potting compound that had been filled, has got a filler in it, and so filled materials will have a have a chance to settle out, uh, much like you think of a paint can that you let set for a while, you'll see the filler settle to the bottom of the can. So it's important that you reincorporate that material into the uh, in, into the product. And again, whether you're hand mixing, it's just basically restoring the material. With a cartridge, it may require you to flip the cartridge every once in a while. With meter mix systems, you can uh, have systems that will automatically um, reincorporate the product um, as you go, and right into the container, right in, and right in the containers themselves. Again, we go back to what's also critical: plan for escape uh, for air to release out of the part. So again, your parts are just as critical, or how you dispense uh, the material into the part. You know, by having the mix nozzle down into the silicone, you will greatly reduce it as compared to having that mix nozzle three or four inches off the part. You know, that will always cause air bubbling over time. And again, if you're using a two-part material, you know, from a process standpoint, our materials can be heat cured. So you can increase the speed at which that material reacts by adding some heat to it. So again, if we look at application techniques, now we have customers today who will take a printed circuit board uh, noted in figure three and just make a, uh, a, a mold and plot the board as is and use the silicone as its own case. However, there's applications where most customers will want to put some kind of case around it and utilize the heat sink that's, that's there. So again, in order to utilize the heat sink best, you want to make sure that you have a good connection between the, the, the case itself and the board. And a good way to do that is either plot it with a, a low viscosity material and or you can uh, apply a thermally conductive RTV uh, to uh, local to localized areas where the heat may be created, such as that chip. And then again, what by using that RTV, it will now allow you to bond the board in place as compared to using a mechanical fastener. It reduces the air space between there. And then you can go ahead and backfill in with a um, potting compound. And again, uh, if you have an open case like this, you know, filling that case up is pretty simple. You just want to make sure again, you want to have a place for air to move and, and release from the material. Uh, at times, you can tilt those cases and uh, use gravity to fill in the areas where, um, where you want it to go. Uh, but again, just remember, uh, you want to have an air path um, in, in that board or in that case so that, again, material can really, uh, the air can get out. So the other thing is where 
you also may have a enclosed case. So we have many times we have a customer that's uh, already assembled it. Now they've got a pot that device that's in a fully enclosed case. Critical there is having a uh, area that not only you can hold that you can fill with, but you also want to have a vent hole. So again, where air can escape out of the case itself as you fill it. I would tell you one of the simplest ways to prevent uh, frustration on your RN when it comes to production. Today's world, we have 3D printing. And we will suggest that uh, our customers 3D print cases in a clear material. And by doing that, you can now easily watch how that material flows around the components so you know where um, bubbles can occur. So you can correct that um, in your process prior to going into production. So again, you know, common defects. The biggest one we see is air voids. And when, you know, air voids occur by, in, in several manners. One, it could be entrained in the material, all right? So the silicone could have air in it. Uh, again, with hand mixing, it's vacuum degassing. In a cartridge, uh, it may, you may allow that cartridge to stand upright for a while before you're going to use it and allow the air to come to the surface, to the top of the material. And uh, the other is, uh, again, in the drum or container size. Um, so many of these meter mix systems will also allow you to vacuum degas the product prior to dispensing. So again, um, air and trapped in the material can be, you know, removed in several different manners. Uh, air and trapped in parts. That's when we usually get the biggest call. Well, I've, uh, I've, I've I potted the part. It looked perfect. And then when it cured, I got air bubbles. And that's a very common question that we see all the time. Or we get all the time. So what has happened? Well, A, most likely you have air underneath the board. All right. You've got a space there where when you filled it, you trapped that air and you didn't see it after you potted it. But over time, that air bubble released itself and came up. Uh, we see... Um, Again, people have made, uh, it dispensed the, the, the material too far off the part, didn't stick the nozzle down into the material and slowly dispensed it. Uh, simple, other simple ways to get that air out of those components are by, you know, preheating the part. You know, so many times guys will, folks will preheat, slightly warm the part, which causes that part to expand. And when you start filling the material up, that part will start to cool off and now pull the material into those areas where it may have had trouble in the past. And so again, designing for air releases is, is pretty critical. And again, using those clear boxes, that, that will help you. Uh, filling from the bottom, again, you always want to try to get to the lowest point of a part and fill that way. And then sometimes we've seen guys vibrate the part, you know, again, where they've, um, they've had to shake the material and uh, shake the component and, uh, reduce air that way. So what happens when you get air in it? You know, what, what, what failures would you likely see? Well, A, it's moisture ingress. You know, you can get, uh, that can be a weak point in the material where you can allow moisture in. You definitely can get dielectric failure. So you could have arcing in that bubble. So across points, you can see some arcing going on. So you could have a, a failure that way. And then air's not very good, um, not a very good thermal transfer material. So it will insulate. So again, by having a solid mass there, you'll get better heat transfer. So let's talk, uh, we're gonna pass this off to Mike to do another live demo for us. Thank you, Chris. Um, we're just gonna pot a material using QSO 550LV. Uh, LV stands for low viscosity. Um, as Chris mentioned, covering up all your air passages uh, for this box, we use the one component material to add a hole in the box for the wires to come through. A one component RTV just to seal it up so it won't have any leaks because leaks are a big deal. Um, just a couple of examples of the one part and the control you have on the size of the bead. So you can have a little bit of material or a lot of material depending on the amount of pressure you put on the trigger when you're dispensing the material. I had mentioned dispensing the box on its side. So we tilt it up on its side, that way you have air underneath the box or underneath the board actually. So you want to dispense the 550, the QSO 550 LV at the lowest point. You just take your time. And as the material flows in, it'll flow underneath the board. And of course, air will move out of its way. 
and run toward the top. And just continue at the lowest point of the board. Again, this is an extremely low viscosity material. There's good thermal conductivity. And it'll just easier if you have very, very small air gaps or air spaces under the components, it makes it easily removes the air and replaces it with silicon. As Chris mentioned, you know, air can be an enemy to electronics. Once you see the silicone coming out from under the board, you can level it off just because all the air is out from under the board. There could be a little bit of air under the components so you could leave it up on its side. Um, but once all the air, you don't see any air bubbles, you can put it flat and uh, just continue to fill and fill it up to the recommended level. This is just a box that we had potted, you know, before previously. And um, another box we potted the other day, just to give you an example of a finished product. Thank you very much. And let's get back to Chris Martin for case studies. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. So folks, you can see where those clear boxes can help you understand flow characteristics and, and uh, how the material can release air. So again, it's a simple, easy way to help you fix your process. Uh, so I'd like to talk about an application we had. We had a customer of ours come to us and said that he had selected a really low viscosity product for an LED driver. And uh, the issue was what they found out after is the low, because the material was so low in viscosity from the competitor to that the material weeped out in areas that he didn't want. It showed up in a spot where he didn't want it. And so, uh, so the, uh, so as you can see here, you can see that uh, threaded areas where they, they had a leak path in itself. So what they came to us and said, hey, wh what can we do? So we, we provided them with a product called QSIL 553, which is about 5,000 centipoise. And it's again, it's heavier in nature, a th little thicker in nature, yet, it self levels, uh, it's got excellent conductivity, it has a UL approval. So again, by, by just using a different chemistry, we were able to correct their issue with regards to a, a leak path. And again, this, is a, this was a sealed assembly um, when, they, uh, when, they, when they filled this. So again, uh, 553, again, UL approved, thermally conductive, it has a UV, uh, V0 rating, so it's ULO, uh, again, a UL approval from an easier way to get your parts uh, approved through the process. So, and then I'd like to talk about the next uh, application, which is a large national sign manufacturer came to us and said, hey, look, I, have a, I wanna create my own LED light. I wanna use it to, uh, uh, as an accent light on, on, a, on a gas station. And so they wanna use this as create their own backlighting. And it's really designed to replace that fluorescent light assembly. So this customer, came, when they came to us and said, hey, look, I'm going to use an aluminum channel. Uh, I'm going to put the LED light strip in it. I'm looking a way to protect the product from the environment. Uh, it'll be exposed. They'll have a lens over it. However, we need me to make sure that the board is, is protected. So we end up selecting a product called QSIL 214, which is a one-to-one -one low viscosity product, a non-yellowing material, Fast cure, all right. So we consider one of the faster curing optical clear products that we offer. And uh, with this customer, they ramped up, and they and one way they ramped up and and met their production needs is by slowly curing the material. I said heat curing the material uh, after they dispense it. So they would go through a dispensing process. They move from a cartridge to a meter mix. They dispense it into the channel, and then they move the move the assembly into an oven at a very low temp. However, it, it reduced their time in half, their, their cure times in half, with, even with a, just a low temp uh, curing process. So just understand 
um, for when you want to post cure, the, the general rule of thumb is every 10 degrees, you increase in temperature of the silicone, not just the part, the silicone, your reaction rate will be cut in half, meaning that the cure time will be cut in half. And so, you know, the other thing I do want to discuss is the uh, some of our latest technologies. You know, for those guys who uh, want to be a little bit niche, you know, be a little different. You know, we have the ability to uh, to provide you a product that you can make your own optics. You know, so again, if you've got a you want to try to um, focus your your light in a certain area, or you want to create a protective barrier, but you want a new optic. So we have a, a chemistry today that is uh, designed to be a product that you could over mold with, that you could injection mold with, so if you're looking at high volumes, but it's designed to create an optic for your assembly. And again, whether it be a lens or a, a small optic in on your board itself, um, this is a product that is, again, optically, in, optically clear and non-yellowing. It has gone through significant amount of hours of testing for UV resistance, uh, heat resistance, so we can provide that data to you. Uh, again, it's a very heat stable product. And again, it will act as a protective barrier against moisture and other environmental contaminants. Now, I'd like to turn, on, uh, turn it over to Tara for some information on products that are, uh, are our leading materials. Thanks, Chris. That was great information. Um, now let's look at some of our top selected products for these types of applications. Um, for optically clear encapsulant products, we have our QSIL 214 that we've talked about several times on here today, um, and our QSIL 223. Both are a simple one-to-one -one mixed ratio thermally conductive materials. The QSIL 214 is a fast room temp cure, platinum cure product with a 40 shore A durometer, and the QSIL 223 offers our highest durometer with room temp cure at about 51 shore A and a slightly lower viscosity. The higher durometers help reduce dust and dirt collection. And both of these products are UL rated as well. And to increase adhesion, we would recommend our QCell primer number five. And this product is designed for optically clear applications and will not cloud or haze. Some additional encapsulating products these are our Tough Gel 332 and our Tough Gel 336. These gels are a softer product than the QCell 214 and 223. Both products are the convenient one-to-one -one mix ratio addition cures. Both are very low viscosity materials. And the Tough Gel 332 is a non-yellowing, optically clear product with a five-hour gel time and the Tough Gel 336 is a black material, which offers that contrast enhancement and is a fast room temp cure product that is self-bonding and has a fast five to eight minute gel time, so a quick cure chemistry. Again, if you want increased adhesion, we recommend the use of the Q-Cell Primer 5 with these products as well. Now let's look at a few of our potting compounds to fill over the circuit board. These products are thermally conductive, so they will aid in pulling the heat away from the board and the components, which makes your product more efficient. Um, the QSO 553 has the highest thermal conductivity of these products. It's a low viscosity, self-leveling, has good flow. Um, our other products here are QSO 550F, QSO 550LV A and C, which Michael used earlier, and our QSO 556. All of these are great products for these types of applications as well, and are all thermally conductive and UL rated. And as we mentioned in an earlier slide, you can um, we offer a uh, customized white pigmented material as well. And for added adhesion with these products, we would recommend our QSIL primer number three. And this primer also comes in a UV tracer option for easy visual inspection under UV lighting. And lastly, here are a few additional products that are commonly used in this type of application. When we talked earlier about sealing the leak pads before filling, these are the one part RTV uh, silicone sealant adhesive that would be used. These are all plastic and ele electronic safe. These are all non-corrosive and offer primerless adhesion. 
Um, the AS1700 is a general purpose, high strength alkoxy product that is translucent in color with a fast skinning time. The other two listed here, the AS1802 and AS1803 are thermally um, conductive materials as well. They use the, um, we use these, you know, for, to bond boards, apply the areas with localized heat around a capacitor to dissipate the heat or to attach a heat sink. But any questions on product selection, please feel free to contact us as we would love to help you with this. Um, I will now hand it off to Andrew and John for our Q&A session. Excellent. Thanks, Tara. Um, so at this point, we've covered most of the basics on potting and encapsulation materials. Uh, if you would like to learn more uh, or you think some of these products would be a good fit for any projects you're working on, uh, please reach out to us after the event. Uh, I have contact information on the screen for myself as well as for Tara uh, from CHT. Uh, our office number and our general email is there as, there as well. So for myself or any other members of my team, uh, we'll try to assist you uh, right away. Uh, we do have a special promotion I, meant, I mentioned earlier for attendees where we are offering 10% uh, off your first order if you're ready to uh, get started. Uh, otherwise, we can send samples if you need to do some testing and we can also set up uh, you know, a consultation uh, to learn more about your application and see if we can find a solution that meets your needs. Uh, look out for a follow-up email that will be sent in the next 24 hours. This will include a PDF copy of the slideshow you're seeing now uh, and an on-demand recording of the whole event if you wanted to share it with anyone else in your organization. Um, all these links will work in the PDF copy, so don't feel like you have to write down uh, all this contact info unless it's just easier for you to do so now. Uh, and then lastly, before we begin the q and I did also want to mention what other products and solutions we offer in case we can help you with anything else. Uh, people also know us for our adhesives, tapes, and fasteners. Uh, many people working in electronics and signage also use certain adhesives and fasteners in their production. So if you're having any challenges involving those kinds of products, uh, we'd be happy to have a conversation and see if we can point you in the right direction there as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to John to get us started with the Q&A. John. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, so let's let's get right into this. I got a couple questions here already. Uh, I, I did see a couple come through about the, the PowerPoint and, and how we're going to get that. Like Andrew mentioned, we'll, we'll, we will be emailing that out. So uh, keep an eye out for that in the next uh, 24 hours or so. But uh, first question here, I got a, a question on uh, accelerating the cure using heat. Um, Chris or Tara sure. or, or Michael. Uh, yes. You mentioned that a couple of times. Could you explain that a little bit further? Sure. So the products that we're talking about are two-part addition cured systems or platinum cured systems. So when you apply heat to these chemistries, that reaction rate will uh, speed up. As, uh, so again, depending on what temperatures you can, your parts can afford, the harder you go, the faster reaction rates that can happen. So again, the good rule of thumb is every 10 degrees you rise, that reaction rate speeds up. Um, or cuts that time in half, or that cure rate in half. Does that answer the question? I, I believe it does. I believe it okay. does. Terry, do you have anything to add, or anybody else? Nope, I think that covers it, yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, I got a couple questions here on the primer, actually. How is it applied, um, and, and, and if you could review the benefits of the primer, uh, number five specifically, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, primers can be dipped, sprayed, brushed. Uh, primers are a very low viscosity material, very water-like. Um, so again, you want to put, uh, primer is one of those chemistries you, you want to put the least amount on. And in particular, primer five is a non-hazing primer. So it's really designed around uh, areas where you may have to attach it to a clear lens or over an LED or uh, glasses involved. So it's a material that doesn't leave a haze and it's used where you need optical clarity. Whereas primer three is a, uh, is a little bit more aggressive. Um, it's an excellent primer for plastics uh, and other metals. So that's really the differences between those. We have multiple primers for you. So again, we can gladly help you select the correct one. And it's, again, it's designed to increase adhesion of silicones. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here on uh, the color of the LEDs. What, will the coloring shift uh, on the silicone? I'm sorry. The, will the, the silicone's color shift in LED? 
So when you apply a liquid to uh, an LED, yes, you're going to have color shift. Now, silicones generally, uh, that shift will be less than other organic chemistries out there, but there is going to be a shift for it. So uh, again, uh, in each LED manufacturer, the shift can be different. So it's going to uh, it's going to require um, some evaluation on your part. So it's uh, again, but you will see a shift no matter what you put on it. However, silicones will shift it less than other chemistry. And the other benefit is if it does age it, you know, there's a chemistry ages, uh, it doesn't discolor, you know, so it, it, can't, it maintains that same clarity as compared to a, an epoxy urine. So whatever clarity you get and whatever light transmission, whatever color shift you get when you first produce it, that's the kind of color shift you can expect, you know, a year, two years, whatever down the line that, to, to kind of uh, put that a different way, right? Would you agree with that, Chris? Yes. Yeah, and, and I went ahead and shared this this slide that we that had a little bit earlier. I know sometimes uh, you know people are kind of in and out, but this is kind of maybe worth showing again real briefly because this kind of speaks to the question. Um, so we look at the different wavelengths of light. So you can see a pretty even uh, amount of light transmission across the, the, the wavelength. There are a couple of uh, dips in lower areas, um, but then if you were to look at a similar chart for other kinds of chemistries, uh, I'm sure you'd see a much, and, and maybe uh, if we, we could provide that uh, after the fact, I don't have that handy at this moment, um, but uh, you can get an idea, at least just visually looking at those, uh, the polymers on the left, you know, which are the silicone compared to other polymers. Um, and, and that's just even just looking at the aging. So I don't know if we mentioned this on this slide, but you could see that what we do is we put those in a chamber, which, which, uh, which accelerates the aging. So you see that that's uh, the second column is uh, 6,000 hours. And then uh, the other one is 6,000 hours plus heat. Um, so you can see how the, the silicone remains uh, pretty constant throughout that process. Um, and other types of chemistries, you know, might not have that uh, same performance. So to kind of sum up Chris's answer, yes, but the ex yes, it will shift. But to what extent is really the question that you're talking about when you're looking at laying a material over over an LED? Right. It is truly. It is best to test, qualify, and design your parts, understanding that impact. And like you said, you know, it's not going to change afterwards. But um, to understand that upfront of what color you are trying to and how it is going to happen. So just test and qualify that. Design your part, understanding that. Great, and, and I, I can add that, that we've sent uh, CHT uh, plenty of samples in the past and they can test that for you too, just to give you a heads up. Uh, I have another question here uh, as far as uh, UV. Will, will the silicones degrade in UV? So silicones themselves, and uh, they, they will not degrade against uh, when exposed to UV. So uh, again, whether it be outside or, or from the light itself, they, they don't degrade from uh, uh, UV exposure. Uh, and you can see that transmission rate. Now, again, uh, use that chart as, uh, as, um, as best possible. If you're looking for something that's lower than the 450 range, then we should have some more discussions because you can see the transmission rate drops off at a lower value, a uh, lower uh, nanometer or wavelength. So that should, that, yeah, but, but general uh, exposure to the sun, no, they will not degrade. Perfect, thank you, thank you. I got a question here from Robert. He, uh, he asked um, that they would like to cover the LED strip circuit boards so you don't see the circuit runs. He asked if he could use a black silicone and barely cover the LEDs so the LED light comes through, but you don't see the circuit board. Uh, that's a great question, uh, Robert. When you, uh, when you do use this material, um, particularly the 336, it's used today in that kind of application. Uh, yes, you want to try to minimize that um, coating over the LED if you happen to get get there. Um, I would say it's not a it's it, it will it will allow you that light to shine through um, with a very thin film, but yet still cover up the paths that that you're asking about. So uh, again, you can do that, and that's a good product to start with is the Tough Gel three three six. Right, and and you have other customers that have done this application, and I think there's products on the market that. That use that so that particular chemistry that are that are available today, right? Yes, yeah, and black's nice because it's a contrast enhancement. But yes, that's exactly where uh, what we have. So, really, offer two chemistries in this market space. I like uh, Tough Gel 336, but there's also a product called 556 that uh, Tara had mentioned. Um, the benefit of the Tough Gel, it will self bond. You do not need necessarily need a primer. The 556 would be recommended that you use a primer. And, but again, and Chris. 
it, for that application, I mean, like some of the LED boards like that you see, like the signage kind of boards, like that almost like look like kind of outdoor kind of TV kind of things with the small LEDs, uh, uh, those kinds of products, like some of those are used in, in that kind of application as well, besides just LED strips uh, with the color. Yes, uh, so yeah, uh, digital displays, uh, digital billboards, I uh, generally use these contrast enhancement materials and in, in 336s uh, extensively used in those. Okay, so there is just to kind of communicate the kind of track record there. So this is uh, definitely something that, that we can cover. Now, this is a question related to that. Uh, would you then need a, to put a clear silicone on top of that to then cover the LED? Or as long as the board is covered, even if the LED is poking out the top, is it then sufficiently waterproof? Uh, or would you need to do a coat on top of that? Well, again, we'd always tell you, again, you want to expose it to the environment where you're going to be, where it's going to be used in. However, with the 336, uh, it will, it will have adhesion to the, the LED. Uh, again, based on your environments, we'd recommend you test it. But yes, uh, I would consider that uh, sufficiently covered and, okay. um, and protected. So you probably wouldn't need an extra, you, you may or may not need an extra coat of clear. No, of I wouldn't system. suggest it. Okay. No, not, not, not initially. Perfect. Thanks, guys. I got a question here from uh, Riza. Um, he's saying for high power application, how is the stickiness of the silicone on the surface? Uh, they added for high temp generally, sealants getting far from the surface affect the color of the LEDs. And they're looking for high color temps. So, um... Let me let me understand the, the tackiness of the material. Um, let me let me read understand. For high I, I believe that's yeah the, the tackiness of the uh, the silicone on the so, surface. Okay, so so again, silicones are going to be um, you know I, I guess maybe maybe it's related to a dust attraction. So again, a high durometer kind of material uh, would be more desirable. Um, there is going to be color shift reason. There will be a color shift, um, but. Again, uh, if you can um, adjust the LEDs that you use for the temps that you're looking for, um, you, could, you could do that. But from a tackiness, uh, I would look at probably suggesting a higher durometer uh, if possible. Right. Now, don't people sometimes use, like say if they used a high, even if they used a lower durometer, would there sometimes still be a, a plastic lens or something on top of that? Um, you, you know, is that that could maybe be an option as well to kind of prevent sure. the dust and and whatever collection, the whatever debris might be forming on the surface. That is correct. Yeah. So that that is correct. Um, and again, that's where some of the the lens molding materials may be used in those applications for that very high duro material. Uh, again, for a if, if dust is really the concern there, or uh, the attraction of dust causing the shift. Right. I would suggest uh, something like that. Yeah. Now, this is something I heard about years ago. I'm, I'm, it just uh, occurred to me now, but was there some kind of coating you guys were developing to kind of make the silicone less sticky, or is that something that wasn't, wasn't actually commercialized? Uh, yes, but I wouldn't recommend it in this application. It will, it'll haze the chemistry. It's designed mm -hmm. to make uh, silicones uh, uh, less, less increase, uh, decrease the friction of the silicone, but it's not generally used in this application. Okay, yeah, I remember you mentioned that something a couple years back that sounded like a neat idea. I was curious if that was something that was ever came to market. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. Great, thanks guys. Uh, I got a question from Michael here. Um, he asked, uh, would you say that 214 under the, the chip height that we showed would be good for water waterproofing in a lens fixture? Yes, I, I would recommend 214. Um, again, may I, I would suggest probably a primer uh, be applied to give you a best adhesion, but it's an excellent product for that kind of application. And it looks like you had a follow-up question about that yeah. primer number five. So yes, the, the, uh, the, the thickness can shift uh, the temperature. So the thicker it is, the, 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 the larger the shift potentially. But I would tell you, um, Michael, you would just want to evaluate it. It's, it's, uh, it varies from chip to chip, or as I say, chip maker or LED maker. So again, um, I would look at, uh, again, thinnest uh, coating over it would be desirable. Yeah, and, and Michael, um, so you asked about the primer number five as well. So I, I think Chris mentioned a little earlier, but just to reiterate that this can be sprayed, uh, dipped, brushed, um, and it's a solvent, all these, these the primers that uh, 
QSO that the CHG offers um, are all uh, solvent-based chemistries that kind of flash off. So basically the primer would be applied uh, to the part um, left to flash off. What, what would you guys say, like five or 10 minutes? Is that generally what it would take at room temperature depending on the humidity? Yeah, I mean, that'd yeah. be a good example, but yeah. 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 Then, then you could apply your silicone, and mm -hmm. then after you have applied your primer, I, I would think you have some kind of window to then apply your silicone before you'd maybe need to reapply the primer. So, is that good for a couple hours, or is that overnight, or what would you say after they apply the primer? How long do they have to apply their uh, silicone? Generally, uh, the uh, I would say no more than a day. You know, a shift uh, uh, that I would desire. Twenty-four hours is max on some of these, but it'll state right on the data sheet how long on part life is. Yeah. And then, you know, a, a lot of customers that I talk to about these applications, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are understandably concerned about the use of a primer. Uh, it's certainly an extra step. And, uh, you know, if you can avoid it, I think most customers want to. So I usually encourage people, I don't know if the CHT uh, folks might agree or disagree, um, but I, I think you could certainly try it both ways when you're doing your evaluation. So, you, you know, perhaps you might want to try it without the primer first, if you're getting satisfactory adhesion. Um, you know, you could maybe save yourself a step depending on the material, uh, you know, the silicones. You're kind of always, with silicone chemistries and really adhesives and, and, and two component polymers in general, you're always kind of trying to balance cohesion and adhesion. Uh, so the, the silicones kind of tend to have higher adhesion. And so, you know, maybe compared to a urethane and an epoxies, the urethane and the epoxies might have higher adhesion, um, but it's just part of the pros and cons of the different process. When you use the, the, the primer and you're getting the results you want, uh, you're, you're, at the end of the day, you'll probably end up with a, with a, a better system that's, that's gonna meet more of your requirements. And the addition, addition of the primer being a one component that only adds maybe five or 10 minutes uh, to the process in terms of waiting for a flash off, uh, you, you know, you're not giving up a lot in terms of time and, and getting a lot in terms of all the other performance characteristics. So I think when you look at everything on balance, I think using a silicone with a primer depending on your needs. You know, we won't say that silicone is the best fit for every application. Uh, we're going to be a good fit for a lot of ones anywhere where there's impact, anywhere where there's, you know, environmental concerns, where you want the maximum longevity. You know, those are maybe the applications where silicone is maybe the best fit for you. Uh, and then in that scenario, uh, you know, I think you're, you're probably in a, in a good situation using a, a primer as long as the, the results you're getting are satisfactory. Would you guys agree with that? Or you say you think you guys always need a primer more or less? No, I, no, again, uh, it's always based on a scenario. So, um, I, again, it's always come down to testing, you know, just to prove it out on your parts, um, yep. whether you get strong enough mechanical adhesion or do you need additional chemical adhesion? So again, uh, it all based on the chemistries you select. There's areas, there's products that you do not need a primer and there's products that you would be suggested, but again, it should be just evaluated. Right. And, and one of the big difference variables there would be the material of the housing or the material of the channel itself. So would you say the silicone is more likely to have higher primerless adhesion to certain materials versus others, so say to aluminum versus plastic? Uh, do you think you're more likely to need a primer on one material versus another? Uh, yeah, it all depends. You know, again, uh, it all depends on the chemistry that's there. You know, what, what's what, you know, what's on the aluminum or what has been, you know, what kind of plastic you're using. So it's really just should be evaluated. And we can yeah. give you we can give you suggestions, um, you know, on what to do there to increase the adhesion on on certain surfaces. Yeah, and, and kind of speaking of adhesion, just the kind of the general best practices of adhesion of getting of optimizing adhesion, just apply the same best practices that you use for adhesives and everything like that, which is having a clean, dry surface. You know, a lot of metals will have finishing greases and oils and stuff on the surface. So making sure that you just have a clean, a clean dry surface is, is just gonna give you the best bonding that you can. That's just kind of a general rule of thumb for everything. Um, I don't know if you guys ever recommend like a light scuff uh, on the parts to, to kind of give you better adhesion, but uh, you know, certainly the more micro cracks and stuff that there is in the, on, the, on the surface will allow the silicone to fill in and give you that mechanical, uh, mechanical connection. Um, and then the other thing about the primers is, you know, they're kind of, they're, they're doing, they have the additives that give you the better adhesion and then they're also solvent based. So they kind of clean as well. So they're, they're, they almost, would you recommend doing a, a, an IPA wipe on the part first and then doing the primers or the primers can kind of clean and, and prime in one step almost? Well, again, I would, I would suggest that you try to get as, as cleanly, uh, as clean as possible prior to applying a primer, you know, it's Fair always, enough. it's always recommended. 
Great, guys. Uh, I, I do get questions from time to time as well. Um, just to ask you guys, people that are using epoxies or urethanes, uh, what's the transition like to a silicone? Is it, is it a simple transition? Well, again, uh, silicones aren't compatible with polyurethane or epoxies from a dispensing standpoint. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to require you to, if you've got a set of pieces of equipment you want to use, uh, that piece of equipment from a transition standpoint, you want to basically flush and, re, and, and replace all the hoses, any wetted parts that uh, need to be cleaned thoroughly. Um, but, but from an application standpoint, you know, how you use a traditional epoxy uh, and, and mixing to a two-part silicone is it can be similar, uh, but again, switching to a, uh, a higher performing type of product. Uh, so again, the, the, they are very similar in nature that way. Uh, again, one of the benefits when we talk about transitioning over, I always think about that second or third step of filling because you haven't met the level due to the shrinkage of those organic chemistries. The silicone, again, you fill to a certain height, it stays at that height. And so that to me is a, a very big benefit uh, in the process. Yep. Here, if I could throw a question and here's something that I get asked a lot uh, as well is we get asked a lot about like underwater, especially when we're in coastal areas, you know, people want to make dock lighting and stuff like that. Um, do you guys have products or other silicones that are available that, that can handle underwater LED applications and, you know, what kind of you know, ratings, uh, I know they have like, the, what is it, the IP ratings that are typically measuring uh, for how the, the level of, of uh, seal that you get on an electronic part, uh, what kind of IP ratings can you expect with certain silicones? Can, can any of you guys kind of speak well, to that? Sure, well, again, uh, we, we have many applications today where people are looking for uh, underwater lighting for boats. And again, they are looking to pot over the, over the LED and they have a sealed system there. You know, they already have a lens and they have a housing and again, uh, that is a common application today. So again, uh, there is a variety of IPC ratings, but again, it will it should pass them. And again, um, all these systems that we worked on have a an enclosed an enclosed uh, case and lens. Okay. So uh, so if if you have a say a clear LED, you know, an LED underwater dock lighting application, for instance, uh, you know, maybe the the one product that we've mentioned a couple of times is the two fourteen. Uh, I, I believe those have been used in underwater applications in the past. And I think some of those parts have, have they have achieved, what is it, the IP, um, I'm trying to remember the number of the certification uh, for the underwater. Maybe we'll throw that in the uh, email afterwards, but was it IP64, or IP16, something like that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. My, I'm not sure I'd have to take a look at my head, yeah. Okay. Great, great. And uh, you guys do carry uh, a, a lot of these formulas in cartridge, uh, cartridges for you know small tests and things like that correct sure so we we do have a sampling program you can you know a lot of these systems are, are designed for uh dispensing through cartridges uh it's a great way if you if um you use a cartridge system it will mimic a lot of times your next move to a production uh snare to a meter mix system again just how you apply it from a with a static mix nozzle a needle tip so it can help mimic the next step in the in your process of automation if you decide to go that route but yes a lot of these will can be offered in a cartridge system yeah and yeah that's a great uh, transition you know or especially for for getting started you know you might not have the volume in a new product that you're producing to to get a meter mix system right away so a cartridge is a kind of great in between kind of system versus uh, you know eliminates a lot of the kind of the pitfalls that exist in hand mixing um, while certainly saving a lot of capital uh, that would be invested in a meter mix system, those, you know, if you haven't invested in any of the systems for any other projects, uh, you can know that they can be uh, quite expensive. Um, and then, you know, other materials that are out there on the market, you might have to buy them and either get them down packed yourself by an outside packaging company or, or something like that, or even fill them yourselves. I've run into other customers that are kind of buying empty cartridges and filling themselves. So, uh, you know, at Chemical Concepts, we are uh, stocking and can special order uh, a lot of the CHT chemistries uh, already in, in cartridges. Um, CHT has the capability to pack a lot of these materials and sell them commercially in cartridges. Um, so that could be a great, you know, kind of added value uh, thing for you guys um, if you're not quite ready or not quite at the volume to commit to a, a meter mix system. Perfect, thank you, Andrew. Well, uh, we're hitting 12 o'clock here. It's been about an hour. Um, 
I, th I think we should just keep this open for another minute or two, wait for any additional questions that uh, anybody in any of the attendees may have. Um, but uh, I mean, yes. is there anything else you wanted to discuss here, Andrew? Uh, it looks like all the questions in the Q and A are answered. I do see some stuff in the chat. Uh, maybe we, oh yeah, it was I, uh, IP sixty eight. Thank you, Stephen. Was the uh, uh, was the IP number for the uh, uh, CLN? Now I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, let's see. Do we have any other questions in the chat that we need to address that haven't been addressed anyway? Let's see. Um, so yeah, we'll just give you another opportunity. If you have any questions that you really need answered before we break, here's, here's your, uh, for, or forever hold your peace. Uh, no, but actually, uh, you know, if you have any questions that we didn't cover here, you know, like I said, we have the contact information up. So you feel free to reach out to us. If you want to go in more depth about your specifics, uh, we'd be happy to uh, spend some time and help you there. Um, but yeah, I think it looks like, I'm looking through the chat here. It looks like most of the questions that are there were kind of covered anyway through our kind of conversation. So I think we can wrap up. Great. Well, uh, uh, thank you everyone for attending. We really do appreciate it. Uh, Andrew, Chris, Tara, and Michael, uh, it's great stuff. Great information here. Um, like Andrew said, if, uh, if you do have any questions, we'll be sending out uh, the PowerPoint and all sorts of PDFs of the slides and, and uh, segments of this, this webinar that you'll be able to see on YouTube. You, should get, you guys should get that within uh, 24 hours. But um, thank you again for attending and uh, stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.